Vinny Cacciano here with my good friend, guitar student, and brilliant podcaster, James Corbett. And uh, we're going to take a look at the song, It Won't Be Long by the Beatles. What we're going to do is, um, is uh, if we make a series out of it, we haven't fully discussed it yet, James, but if we do a series, you and I together, we're going to go through uh, each record, pick one song chronologically. Uh, we've already done one from the first record, so we're going to their second, and we're going to be doing the song It Won't Be Long. Yeah. And let's remind people about that first one. Right. Uh, remind them... <laughs> Which song? <laughs> oh, uh, uh, right, right. It Won't Be Long. No, no, no. Yeah. Which song did you do first? What was the first one? Because you did one from uh, Please Please uh, Me. You did. Oh, we did. Uh, oh, dang. There's a place. Oh, There's a place. There's a place. And that Great. was specifically at my request. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, this one's at your request. This one too. is also at my request. I, I love this. I'm, it's like the You're, you're going to be the guy that chooses, okay? Yay. You're the guy that chooses. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I've chosen a couple of good ones so far, so let's keep it going. All right, so this one is going to be It Won't Be Long, which, keeping track at home for people who are interested, was the uh, the opening track of the Beatles second UK album with the Beatles. And so uh, there was a lot of kids back in 63 who popped this on the record player and plopped down the needle and this suddenly started blaring out at them. Can you imagine? Um, and I'll just, I'll read a little bit just to give people the background. Yeah, go for it. Uh, Won't Be Long kicked off the Beatles' second UK album with the Beatles. It heavily featured the band's distinctive yeah, yeah signature established with She Loves You. This time in a call and response style between Lennon on lead vocals and McCartney and Harrison doing harmonies. I think this is completely different than She Loves You, but anyway. Uh, the song was written mainly by John with help from Paul. Uh, they were especially proud of the juxtaposition of Be Long and Be Long, which McCartney compared to the wordplay that influenced Please Please Me. I was doing literature at school, so I was interested in plays on words and onomatopoeia. John didn't do literature, but he was quite well read, so he was interested in that kind of thing. Like the double meaning of please in a line like, <clears throat> please lend a little ear to my please, that we used in please please me. We'd spot the double meaning. I think everyone did, by the way. It wasn't just the genius of us. In It Won't Be Long Till I Belong to You, it was the same trip. We both like to try and get a bit of double meaning in, so that was the high spot of writing that, that particular song. John mainly sang it, so I expect that it was his original idea, but we both sat down and wrote it together. Uh, it Won't Be Long wasn't the Beatles' most polished studio performance, nor was it a fixture of their live set. It was, however, an attention-grabbing start to With the Beatles, proving to listeners that Please Please Me and She Loves You had been no flash in the pan. Uh, the Beatles were more intellectual, so they appealed on that level too, but this is John, by the way. But the basic appeal of the Beatles was not their intelligence, it was their music. It was only after some guy in the London Times said there were Aeolian cadences in It Won't Be Long <laughs> that the middle classes started listening to it because somebody put a tag on it. <laughs> uh, in actual fact, in his article What Songs the Beatles Sang, the Times music critic William Mann mentioned Aeolian cadences in Not a Second Time rather than It Won't Be Long. Lennon, mm -hmm. however, mentioned it once more in his 1980 interview with David Sheriff, uh, David Sheff, and then it goes on from there. So that's just some of the background. And I, <laughs> I shouldn't admit this, but I'm going to admit this. I didn't notice Be Long, Be Long. Oh, really? <laughs> that yeah. never occurred to me until right this moment <laughs> reading that. <laughs> Whoosh, went right over my head. In fact, I think that George Harrison may have tried to avoid people thinking that he was using the same pun in his song, uh, Blue Jay Way. Please don't be long. Please don't be very long. Uh, you know, like, like he's trying to say, yeah. I'm not doing the same pun here. You know? Right. Yeah, I never know. It's right. funny because there's also a, a Smashing Pumpkins song that has the same, we won't be long, we won't be long. A double play that again went over my head for like 20 years until I read about it and I'm like oh oh I get it <laughs> so I'm not very good at this apparently well you know uh I, as I researched this song I you know I rely a lot on like okay what's he doing on the guitar there what's he doing on the guitar there and very often I could see if I see a video of them playing I could translate it uh, otherwise I really have to hear it very closely and unfortunately I found out they they never performed the song live, which is mind blowing to me because it's high energy. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, it's it's strange, yeah. but then again, it wasn't a single, and by this point, their sets were like twenty minutes, and they were just going mm -hmm. through the hits, right? So, understandable, right. but still, yeah, they should have played it live. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's unbelievable how things were in those days. The mm -hmm. twenty minute 
concert. Yeah. You paid six dollars to go to, and that was a lot of money. Mm-hmm. You know. <laughs> How much was a record? An album? God, I don't know if I remember. Like eight bucks, eight nine bucks, maybe eight bucks, probably eight bucks, seven eight bucks, something like that. Yeah, like an album. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so should we I'd listen like to, to a bit of it for, before we get into it, or do you yeah, let's to... let's give it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sure. So we'll... let's listen to a little bit. This is obviously we're not going to play the Beatles. That would be a big no no. So let's listen to something called the Beatles Experience, who are apparently out of Argentina, and uh, it seems to be a bunch of young lads who put on a good show. So let's listen to a little and bit. And it's a good enough replication. Yeah. They do a decent enough job replicating all the yeah, parts. Vocally, so, too. Yeah. I thought I like it. Okay. expect from a pop song but there it is yeah there it is and you could hear that loungy ending that they do you know the beatles definitely had that in them I, there were a few things about the beatles even as a little boy i i i consider to be like kind of their their signature or their thumbprint you know um one of them was they i used to when i was a kid i used to harmonize with my cousins and we'd sing in thirds you know but the Beatles would, would break things down like, oh, we're on this chord, so we can't do a third here. I'm going to sing this note. You sing that note. We're going to find out that's happening in this song with the yeah, yeah parts. Um, so, all right. So one thing I want to hit on right away, because it was a revel, suddenly like, bam, it was this epiphany for me. You know how there are interviews with John and Paul and John will say, oh, I wrote 100 percent of that Paul, that song. Is, and Paul will say, oh, we sat down together and we yeah, wrote 50, 50, right? right? Yeah, yeah. I finally figured out what's going on with all this. There's a difference between writing a song, right, and arranging a song. Mm-hmm. OK, so if you could picture John Lennon showing up to show the rest of the Beatles, it won't be long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, they, yeah. they weren't there. Yeah. It won't be long, yeah, till I belong to you. No lick, right? So the Beatles all contribute. I'm sure John, uh, maybe Paul, uh, Paul or George came up down, 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 right? Um, another thing which we're going to find out is a clipped verse. The the verses are not eight bars. They're seven bars long. We'll find out about that. <laughs> yeah. I'll give you a clue. The key to it is in the lick itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the the lick right. does twice at the end, which right. seems a bit, yeah, like something but kind of tagged tied... under. All right, let's look at a verse. All right, so... Um... All right, so the, the the second part of the lick leads into the uh, yep. into the yep, 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 chorus. Yep. All right, so now this is what I'm thinking. You know, back in those days, it was the two minute and thirty second pop song. Yeah. Right. 
Can I you think pack any fly. more into two minutes and 30 seconds than the Beatles it do? Blows it's my, crazy. It always blows my mind. Like yeah. when I, every, uh, Revolver, right? Revolver. Yeah. I listen to Revolver. Yeah, go, yeah. You get so much bang for your buck in under three minutes. You yeah. know, it's like, holy crazy. Cow. It's amazing. Yeah. All right. So, um, uh, yeah. So, as far as the arrangement goes, right? So maybe George came up with the lick. And they now if you think about it, the natural the natural way it would go is um, every night when everybody has fun. Da, 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 da. Right, twice. Yeah. It does twice at the end. Yeah. So you have to ask yourself, well, why they do it once? Well, number one, let's not do overkill on people, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. which is a, a that, you know, respect because, like, you know, a, a lot of people, when they write, hate to edit stuff out. They hate to take yeah. stuff out of their music or yeah. even you know, writing. So uh, you're really right about yeah. that, because, yeah, that would be the natural thing you would do. You would do that like twice, but it makes it so much more effective the second time because right. they didn't it do does. it the first time. It brings you right back into the energy of it, yeah. you know. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. So there's that. Um, so the verses are very simple. E major to C major. All right, and I like the way these kids did this because they emulated a lot of the guitar parts. Like Harrison does that, mm, right? Yeah. Uh, right. Right. So there's that, you know. Uh, but it's very, it's very basic. But where does a C chord come in in the key of E? All right. So, so this is the very beginnings of what happen later in hard rock, that kind of chord movement where you have, I used to call it wandering major chords where mm. they don't really plug into the key, but they work. Right. So this is going to be a parallel uh, relative switch is what you're going to say. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. So uh, parallel relative switch, just real quick, like real quick. because it's. You know, uh, I'm in the key of E major. <laughs> I go parallel, which means I take my root chord, which is E, and I turn it from major to minor. You know all this change, of course. And then E minor becomes the relative minor of the key of G major. And if I take the 1, 4, 5 of G major, I have a C chord in there. So we're borrowing from two different keys, and that's actually from the blues, eventually, uh, when you break it all down. It well, what's interesting to me is it starts with the C sharp minor. Yeah, yeah. But then you get and the C major. And and by the way, too, I want to comment here that remember I mentioned to you, maybe it was in the last podcast, but I mentioned to you that I suspect that John and Paul perfected the art of songwriting before way before they became famous. Like they already, you know, they worked and worked and worked and worked on, on these songs. So even when they were just reaching, uh, you know, high levels of fame, they were already writing very sophisticated stuff. It was already happening. And I think in this song, we're going to find out just how sophisticated this stuff was. Now, one of the tricks, and I, I'm almost led to believe that maybe, sometimes I think George Martin came up with this. I'm not quite sure, but we're starting with the chorus mm. of the song. Yep. And uh, that happens a few times with the Beatles, especially in the early days. She Loves, she you, loves you starts yeah. off with the chorus, yeah. you know. And note the high energy of it, yeah. you know, it just, boom, right out there. I'm so surprised they didn't do this live, because it's a great, it would be a, would have been a great live song for them to do. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it starts with the uh, the chorus, and which is C sharp minor, E, C sharp minor. A sharp diminished seven E. This is amazing. All right here. And there are there are four kinds of triad. Okay, there's a major triad, there's a minor triad, then they're kind of like those are two restful triads. 
the tense triads diminished are diminished and augmented. Diminished and augmented. And in this song, very early Beatles, their second record, even in the first record they were using them. But we get a diminished chord at one point and an augmented chord at another point, which we'll see. And this is remarkable. Okay. So anyway, what we get here is... Right? Um, I was trying to figure out, like, what it possibly was, because I can't picture them doing this this form. It, it's a very advanced, not very advanced, but it's a jazz form. It's something that a jazz guitar player would do. Right? And I don't know if we talked about this already, but there's a little bit of blues in there, right? That's the ending of Lady Madonna. So uh, that diminished. What's going on? Um, we have an A major. This is an A sharp diminished seventh. Not just plain old diminished, but diminished seventh. And you can hear it's a beautiful resolution. Mm. It works perfectly. Yeah. Uh, the way I would normally do it on a guitar to keep the line going, uh, I would do it like that. But it doesn't matter. You still hear it. All right. So yeah, very uh, not terribly complicated. But that one little that one little moment of the diminished seventh chord is where did you guys come up with that? Yeah, uh, and I will just so, note parenthetically that the major tab sites on the internet do not note it as an A sharp diminished seventh. They go A E what are C they? E. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that is so wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I oh, get why if you so have funny. no idea what you're listening to, you might eh, close enough. But no, it really oh, is. Oh God! Maybe you know why I have this. Like you know, I'm 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 in the musical equipment of a grammar Nazi. You know, I, I just can't stand it when people play a Beatles song and they do the wrong chords. It's just yeah. maddening because it's subtle. It's it's mm -hmm. that's what makes it great. The subtlety. Of, of this one little chord that comes in that you totally don't expect, and yet yeah. it flows right through the music, yeah. no problem. Nothing, it's not even pretentious. It's not even, oh, look at the chord we're doing. It's just flows naturally through the music. Beautiful. Is that one of those chords that you think they knew what they were doing, or they just said, oh, that kind of sounds cool? I have no idea. I, honest to God, I, I, I can't fathom. I mean, I do know they got jazz, not jazz guitar lessons, but they, they, did, you might know. You probably know more about this lore than I do. Uh, that they, there was some teacher that they I just know to, that Paul and George uh, took the bus across town to learn a few chords from somebody. Uh, some yeah, yeah. You know, but I don't know the details of what he taught them, other than B seven. Everyone knows B seven, right? Right, the old B seven story. Yeah, yeah. Which I I found out. I kind of embellished. I I said that they rode on their bikes for ten miles to get the B seven chord. No, they took a bus. Yeah, it was a bus. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can see that. Uh, in till there was you. Yeah. yeah, till there was uh, you. I was just listen, re-listening to the whole album and uh, listening to that and listening to that final chord. I'm like, what? Yeah, like wow, you know. So that's where we get that's where we get that loungy influence of the Beatles because very often you'll hear a six nine chord, um, uh, that kind of sound for their ending. You know, uh, six chords. They're definitely tacky. Even as a kid, I registered as kind of tacky, you know. But, uh, you know. I love the Beatles. A6 at the end of Help. Break. I think that's just yeah. beautiful. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well. I, I have to think about that. It's an A6. Well, it's in the harmony, isn't it? I mean, I don't think they play an A6. Yeah, that's it. Right. They're definitely the six. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Like works perfectly. Perfect. Anyway, <laughs> back to it won't be long. Okay. So, um, yeah. Uh, so we've got that, uh, that resolution. Uh, 
<laughs> so we spoke about that. Um, I don't know if there's much else I could say about this diminished seventh. I remember I had a few more thoughts about it earlier when I was looking at it. But I see if that's in my notes. No, it just says an error so thing. Let's just make about. that explicit for people. What is the line that in that resolution? Ah, oh, right. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and I think what we'll do is uh, go back. Like, we'll right now we're talking about chord movement. Yeah. We could talk about the background harmonies and the yeah. lyrics and other okay. things like that. Yeah. Um. So now we have the third section, man. This is the juice. This is the. Uh, this is One mistake those kids made. It's yeah, F sharp. not F sharp minor. No, okay. I I listened to it a number of times. I, yeah, it's F sharp, and I love it. I absolutely love it. It's it's really surprising what goes on in this section here. Very John Lennon. Um. So we have what we have is a descending line, ostensibly of major chords. If I just played major chords, I'd get this. <laughs> Now that second chord sounds a little offish, right? It's almost there. So now this is where where you, the question you asked earlier, like, okay, did they think of this? Did they say, oh, you know what? That sounds like that. Maybe we could correct it by doing this. No idea. But here's the deal: we're in the key of E major. And we want to get eventually down to that, that uh, C-sharp 7. And we're going chromatically, meaning in half steps. But when we take this E and go down the half step, the notes we have are a D-sharp. The D-sharp is within the key of E. We have G note, which we might be able to justify through the blues. That's the blue note. But we have this B flat that's like a flat at five in the key of E. That's a Lydian sound, but it's a little, it's not for the song. So the B flat is really the culprit because, you know, again, we back to the, the uh, D sharp up top here. So it's just three notes. So what can we do to justify it to the key? Well, this is a B flat. This is the bad note. But we're in the key of E, which has a B natural. So what if I took this chord and turned this B flat into a B? I get. Now the rest just flows. D. Now that. Um, There was a Boz Gag song in the disco era. Uh, Got you thinking like that. Low Down, it was called. And, uh, yeah, you'd, you'd have to look it up. But it has a section where the inevitable violins, violins were really big. The string section in disco was really big in those days. And... Uh, uh, That was in the Bosquex on it. This is not an uncommon line. I mean, it's been done, but the Beatles certainly were the first rock and rollers to ever do that. You know, I mean, when you consider the primitive quality of rock and roll and what these guys molded it into, it's just beyond the beyond. This is incredible stuff. So, so in other words, we're justified to get that line. And again, it's kind of like blues, but it's not blues against the uh, the one chord. It would be blues against the the two the four chord, right? But all right, so we got E, D sharp augmented D, and I'm willing to get to say that he went to a C sharp seven. All right, 
Now, here's the kicker. Do you know what the C-sharp 7 might be? Do you have any idea? No, because if we're in E, it should be a C-sharp minor. But you right. can't disguise a minor when as you a turn, 7. But when you turn one of the chords of a key into a 7th chord, it becomes a... I'll be uh, happy to answer a, that a, question. A, 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 a secondary dominant? Yes, indeed. For what? In the key of E major, yeah. C sharp seven resolves to F sharp minor. Oh, right. But John Lennon is a standard, like weird, unexpected John Lennon move. Doesn't go to F sharp minor, the very much expected sound. He goes to A major. A major. What justifies it? All right. Can, do you have any guesses? Not at all. <laughs> okay. No. Uh, just look at my fingers here. I'm just gonna the the just the 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 notes that I have my fingers on. Here's an A major, right? Here's an F sharp minor. Two notes are very familiar. So we have enough of the F sharp minor to justify that A major. And I think we just spoke about something similar to this recently in, in uh, one of your guitar lessons or something like that. Yeah. Did we? <laughs> maybe, <that's right> <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I wasn't paying attention. But I, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I say a lot of stuff during the course of a lesson, so forgive you me sure for that. Do. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, yeah, it works beautifully. And then we go to the B7, and then the F sharp 7? 7. And then e, uh, B, B7, back to E. Yeah, now, any Beatles purists out there might say, oh, it's not an F-sharp 7, it's just F-sharp, it doesn't matter. If they're acting, if it's F-sharp major or F-sharp 7, it doesn't matter. It's acting as an F-sharp 7. It's doing the job the F-sharp 7 would do. So just let's be clear about that, because I didn't get to watch John Lennon's fingers when he was doing it. So uh, to play the, the line again... <laughs> So um, we go A to B, which is four to five in the key. And uh, rather than going home, he takes us to the F sharp seven, which also eventually brings us to the B. And they didn't do the cliche. No, right. Yeah. <laughs> which <laughs> I'm sure they did that somewhere, but it's not in this song. Uh yeah, so uh, one thing to mention is this is again we're talking now we're in the arranging universe. Now now we're in the in the space of okay, the F sharp 7 sounds good, but maybe we should build it up. And then well maybe we should build up the B2 cuz we're going back to E, so But they don't do that. They build up the F sharp 7 and then they go into a normal strum on the B. But what happens is, at the moment that they cut off that buildup, they give Ringo the drum roll to make that space interesting. So again, here they are sidestepping the cliches and doing new and interesting things, and they're arranging. Uh, okay, let me give you a completely non-musical analysis um, take on this. The feeling of that bridge, to me, is like the feeling of the bridge in uh, From Me To You. And in this case, it's not going to a minor tonality. It's not changing. It's still E major, right? But for some reason, the feeling of it, it reminds me of that. <laughs> That part? Yeah. Let's see. Now, it's a totally different ball game there. Yeah, that I was, mean, it's, musically, was... it's not at all the same. But there's something about the feeling of the shift in the song in that moment. 
there you go. I mean, that's great composition. Again, that's good composition. It's just taking you to a new place. But it's interesting you know? because, and for me to you, I understand it musically how they did that. They shifted to a minor tonality. But in this case, they're not changing keys at all. It's the same. But it you you still feel the same shift in the song in that moment. Why? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, you're talking about mm. you're talking about the bridge, James. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Since you left me, I'm so alone. Now you're coming. You, I, I think it might be something to do with the, the harmonies. Are the harmonies doing something in that moment that changes the? Yeah, yeah. The harmony. Um, speaking of which. Now, what they're doing on the harmony, I, I didn't get real close with it, but it, um, listening to the boys that, that band do it, they, it sounds like if they're copying the record exactly, I hadn't noticed this. And my, uh, I, I lost a lot of frequencies in the high range, so I, I don't know if I missed it because of that. But they're doing... Oh, by the way, while I was driving along, I, I thought to myself, oh, James should look into you, uh, to Squeeze. That's a great band he should look into from the... Uh, 80s. They were an outgrowth of the new wave, and uh, you'd like them. They were a Brit band, and they did really interesting chord progressions. So we'll talk about it some other time. Uh, all right. Now with that side note, I forget what I was talking. <laughs> harmonies <laughs> in the room. Uh, yeah, the harmonies uh, squeeze. What they one of the the things that squeeze used to do was one guy would sing low, and the other guy would sing in the high octave the same line. Mm. So it wouldn't be a harmony. It'd right. just be as if unison, except mm -hmm. in an octave. Um, so the, the way these kids did it was exactly like that. There's no harmony there, but they're following, uh, they're following line. No, I'm sorry. Um, let me see. Should we listen to it again? Yeah, let's listen to it. Yeah. That's So these are all chord notes. Let me just see something for a second. Yeah. Mm, so just beautiful. following the line, but really making it explicit. Yes, and the last time we did a podcast, you threw me a curve by saying, well, let's talk about the lyrics. And I always listen to the music, so I just don't think of the lyrics. But I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be ready for this. James is going to ask me, what are they singing in the background? And what I got was, you left me here alone, and now you're coming on home, right? There are three lines. I can't sing that high. Yeah, yeah. But point being, though, if you listen really closely, and the last line, the, the lines are, you left me here alone, kind of call and response. And that's actually a big thing to talk about, too, is call and response was a thing. It was a thing back then. I wish it would come back because there's something kind of joyful about it. Unfortunately, it's equated with tackiness now. Anyway, uh, the background is saying, you left me here alone. Now you're coming on home. And now I looked this up because I, I couldn't hear it, but I heard a shh sound in there. And they say that the last line is now I should come in on home. And that makes no sense at all. Now, I've been in the studio a lot, a lot. So I know these little clips that people like to do to, to make things clearer. The line I think is now she's coming on home, but they clip the S at the end of she's. So it says now she coming on home. And I think they did that purposely 
because the sound would have been getting in the way at the end of, of she. So I believe that they're saying now she's coming on home. Now she coming on home. Hmm. And, and what, it's did, a little what did they bit, sing here? They don't sing that at all. It's hard to make out, right? Yeah. Well, they're just going, uh... Hmm? Oh, they're not singing lyrics. No. Oh, okay. All right, yeah. Oh, there's one other thing I wanted to point out. Uh, I to you. Right? You hear uh, Paul and George singing, uh, and that's all. It cuts off. They don't resolve it. They don't go... Right? Oh. Interesting. And they, these kids do that. Hmm. They do that. Hmm. Now, the question is, why would they cut it off? Why would they not resolve it? I thought about this. Now, the way the harmony goes, we have an A to a C sharp, and then we have an A sharp to a C sharp, right? Now, the only way you could come up next is one guy would have to go up to the B, and the other guy would have to go up to the E. Uh, right. And that's a little awkward. Yeah. That's a little awkward. And not only that, but here's the kicker. John's vocal melody hits that B note at just that point. So he fills it in. And mm -hmm. they thought about that. Yeah. They said, let's cut mm -hmm. it off here. John's filling in the note anyway. The only other way they could have done it, it was like this. That's the other way they could have done it. Yeah. And it, 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 they probably thought, no, this is too, you know, jumpy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's let John come in. And here's a bit of trivia. Listen, when, when we go off air, listen to uh, the third chorus, uh, the Yaz. George doesn't sing the first Yaz, just Paul. And the second one, it kind of jumps like he, oh, yeah, I got to <laughs> sing. <laughs> jumps in in the middle. So I have two theories about this one. Give it a listen. You'll hear it. Like, yeah. it's just Paul alone at first, right? Yeah. Yeah. I have two theories about this. One is that George sang some bad notes, and they just that erased that part of the tape. I don't know if they had the capacity to do that back in those Probably days. Probably like, not, I would think. But yeah. Maybe. So then it must have been that George forgot yeah. to sing. That's very likely, and, actually. Um, because and when with, you listen to I was going to say with um, um, eight days a week, uh, when you listen to the takes that they were doing, you could hear George was just learning the song as they were doing the first few takes. Like he was, mm -hmm. couldn't quite, he didn't know exactly, oh, what are the chords again? <laughs> and he was just getting it as they were recording it. And then by the end, he kind of pretty much got it. But you could still hear there was a bit of hesitancy in his performance in that. Yep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I they were just churning it out at an incredible rate. So it's very possible that George just flubbed it and eh, good enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I was thinking about that too. You know, like if you have a generally, like the way recording, you know, I think people forget, like the younger generations forget that recording in those days, you virtually had to play live. It was just about that. There was no overdubbing. There were no multi-tracks, you know. This was two-track recording, you know. So the thing is, if you you get a great energetic performance and then someone hits a, like a mistake, you know, well on the, you know, on the mixing board, they could yeah, fade drop it, out it a little bit, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, if they even had that capacity, mm. but you know, it's kind of like when the hole is that good, yeah, it's a, it's a subtle little glitch. It sounds good enough. You mm. know, when you hear, did, have you, did you know that, that George dropped out before I told you? I didn't consciously register that. No, no. Yeah. Right. So, in other words, it sounded good enough. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's probably what they said. Yeah. And they were so, right. Yeah. Yep. Took 50 years for Vinny Caggiano to unearth it. Uh, actually, I think there's an entire YouTube channel that's dedicated to the little glitches and things in <laughs> Beatles recordings. Like, you can hear a little bit yeah. of the bleed through on this track over here if you listen carefully <laughs> with one ear. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, yeah, Beatles fanatics are like Star Trek nerds or Game of Thrones nerds. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's the yeah. same thing, you know. Yeah. It's like, let's get down to the finest little detail. Which, well, you, <laughs> I'm doing the same thing, you know. You know, like, you know, Mark Hamill is a big Beatles nerd, so that kind of does oh. close the loop on that. Ah. Uh, ah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that closes the loop. And uh, speaking of closing loops, what else do we have here? Uh, so now we got to talk about the ending, I think. Just one more thing. Let's talk about the yeah harmonies. Oh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Now, real quick. Um, so we have, that's the high harmony. Now, it won't be long, yeah, yeah, right? That's the yeahs. So we have a C sharp and a G sharp. That is a perfect fifth. All right, there is an example of the Beatles not using thirds. But when we go to the E chord, George goes up from this to then. So it won't be long, yeah. It won't be long, yeah. It won't be long, yeah. And then the... And by the way, that would be really hard to sing live, to make that jump from doing this to... But they do it. Or cut it off. All right, yeah, so there's that. The Beatles, again, I can't stress this enough, weren't just about singing parallel thirds in their harmonies. You know, they jumped to a chord tone. They'd open it up in a different way. And I heard that even as a kid, that their harmonies were like, oh, that's, that's unusual what they're doing, you know? I actually heard this as a kid. I, could, I registered it somehow. So there's that. Let's talk about the ending now, which is... Totally loungy. Uh, to you. Right. And that's just an E minor? That's an E major 7. Ah, right, okay. And at first I was using this form, and I'm thinking to myself, nah, they didn't know that form. They must have known this one. And I'm pretty sure this is the one they knew. It doesn't matter much. And it's loungy because it's going down in half steps in a similar way to, like, the passing tone in uh, If I Fell, right? Yep. Yep. Is that is that yep. what defines that loungy sound? The is what? It, it, the half step uh, going down? There are a few factors. That that could be, that can account for some of it. Um, also, the softness of major seven chords. Six chords, major seventh chords... And six nine chords tend to sound loudy. Loud. Uh, here's a six. Here's a major seven. Always sounds Hawaiian to me. Yeah, yeah. No, because those guitars are tuned to the six is kind of built in. Here's a major seven. And here's a six nine. Yeah. All very, Beatles very, ending chords. Very fluffy, pillowy. Yeah. yeah. Now, it won't be long yet. Now, you notice John has the solo till. Uh, belong to you notice we don't get I belong to and I don't know why they they mm. didn't do that mm. because it's so yeah. juicy it's so yeah. good mm. but it, there may be when you I belong to there's that kind of dissonance in that low note so maybe John said let's just leave the A belong to you now here's an interesting thing he comes to the root and and what happens here is a pedal point it's the opposite of a line the chords move the pedal remains so we do have a line you know but we have this pedal point and if you listen to it against each chord right And instead of keeping the pedal, they take it down the half step. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. It's the exact right thing to do. Yeah. That is so musical. That's so jazz. That's like jazz minded. That's what a jazz guy would think of. Not a rock and roller from the early 60s. I mean, that that's brilliant. Right? That, that, do you think George why? Martin had a hand in that? Or do you think they no, came up I, with that? No, I... I don't think that's George Martin's uh, territory. I, I usually, I'm pretty good intuitively when I could sense George is stepping in on on some things. And, I, you know, he gave them a lot of free reign, too. Uh, and let's just, 
real quick to wrap it up, I want to talk about the vibe. The lyrics are really basic, you know. Um, I'm not going to recite the lyrics. Uh, let me see, Susie. Let me. I'm so. Uh, no. Uh, won't be long. Yeah. Till it won't be long till I belong to you. He's expecting. They must have kissed once or something, and she's away, but he knows they're going to get together. And I love the, you really do feel, the beauty of this song is you feel the anticipation, his excitement that she's coming, she's going to be coming soon. Uh, well, don't take that the wrong way. But, <laughs> <laughs> that too. but uh, she'll be arriving back, you know, where, where he's at. And, <laughs> and uh, this is very classic early 60s kind of vibe. Um, this is, don't forget, this is all music for teenagers, and teenagers are having the urge to grow up. So there, there were lots of songs about going to parties. It's my party, and I'll cry if I want yep, to, yep, 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 right? Yep, 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 yep. Um, going to clubs, you know, there's a cool club I know, and it's in the city. The city was a big thing, because when you're 16 years old, you're not allowed to go to the city. But you have that draw like when i get old enough i'm go that's what happened to me i you know as soon as i turned 18 i wanted to go to the city that was it so there's a the whole that whole feeling of that this happy anticipation and yeah. i think he really really brought it home and i think the way that that is done is rhythmically in this song it's the uh it's a the, lot of it's the the strum pattern has that propulsiveness oh, by the way thing. speaking of that we have the classic serp beat that that Da, yeah, yeah, da, da, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, the guitar is doing that. It won't yeah. be long. Yeah. yeah. Which is also kind of reggae. -ish exactly. Too. I'm gonna say it's almost kind of a reggae-ish thing, but mm -hmm. like before reggae. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, they were aware of reggae really early on. That they were really? aware of it. Really? Uh, it, it's quite possible because mm. I know John spoke one of the really early songs, and he said. Yeah, we tried to give it a reggae feeling. Oh, I yeah. think his first ever song was Calypso Rock. So I don't know what he was influenced by exactly, but, you know. Maybe the term reggae wasn't going yeah, around in those probably days. not, but something like it. Anyway, that, yeah, yeah. it's that feel. And that that's such it's an important part of the, the rhythmic structure that gives the impulsiveness to the song. Oh, yeah, and that, 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 I call it a surf beat because he's so really associated with... <laughs> Da, 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 mm, yeah, yeah. Da, da, yeah. Da, you know that was the cool drum beat back in those days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, thank you, James, for uh, participating. Thank you. In this. this is great. Um, so, are we yeah. going to stick with with the Beatles, or do we move on to the next album now? We'll just move on to the next album. Uh, what do you, uh, well, we'll talk about. It. We'll, we'll talk, talk about, about it. it. All right. Okay. Yeah, we'll figure it out. We'll leave people on the edge of their seat. Yeah, but I'm so happy to have you on board doing this with me. It's just really wonderful. It's very inspiring and cool. So, Hey, well, I'm just sitting here always waiting for your next video to come out. So if I can help it to come out, I will do so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so, yeah, uh, maybe we'll go to the next record, pick a cut, or maybe we'll yeah. stay on this record, pick a cut. It, it's not a big deal either way. I mean, Perhaps we should invite so people in the comments with suggestions. We're open to suggestions, right? That is a great idea. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, that's that's a great idea. We'll 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 open it up and see if they want us to move, pick a song from the next record, and keep going yeah. chronological that way. But we'll the British one. records, the the real ones, not the American yeah, the, monstrosities. Exactly. <laughs> uh oh. Well, <laughs> that's gonna do it for today, folks. <laughs> I think I'm wrapping this one up by myself. Anyway, <laughs> let me give a big plug for Vinny before uh, I hang up here. Uh, everyone, please support his channel and uh, his various socials. I'm sure he'll put the links in the description. But that's going to do it for today. See you next time.